since our last Bible study, I've barely slept. I thought our group was thriving, but I guess I'm not so sure anymore. After that weird small group meeting, I had a really rough week at work. It, it left me feeling like maybe I was just, I don't know, letting things go spiritually, making too many excuses. After study group, I, I felt better, lighter, like I wasn't alone. I thought it was good. I felt like people were actually being weird with each other. After small group, I knew I had some choices to make. Ugh. Hey, guys. Hi, Welcome hi. back. What? Well, sorry. It's just weird to see you sitting over there. I mean, <laughs> we always sit in the same places. That's right. This is just one of the ways we're shaking things up today. Oh. Get ready. Mm. Should we wait for Jeff? He's never late. Oh, he Maybe he's shaking things up, too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> well, while we're waiting, I thought maybe we could clear the air a little bit from last meeting. You've all been on my heart. How are things? Uh, all right, well, I'll start. I'll start. It was a really rough week. Mm -hmm. I found out that I was being passed over for a promotion at work that I, I thought it was a done deal. Uh. I was so embarrassed. Mm. I was really angry, and I just couldn't believe it. I, I, and I, I didn't handle it very well. Mm. I needed to clear my head, so I decided to take a lunch break, <laughs> which I never do. And I ran into Laurel. Yes, that was great. I never knew we worked so close to each other. <laughs> mm. Now, you know I'm not crazy about those Christian cliches, <laughs> but you know, this really was a God thing. Mm. Laurel, Laurel let me vent to her, and, and she let me talk, and we continued to talk, and she, she helped me see things from a whole different perspective. You know, that I could take my frustration and, and use it as a wall between me and God, hmm. which I wanted to do, um, or I could seek him out, reach out to him, reach out to you guys. Wow. Well, I'm sorry to hear about the promotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all right. You know, I think maybe not getting it has given me an opportunity to kind of look at my priorities. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if I'm going to grow in my faith, I, I need to stop keeping God and church and, okay, everyone <laughs> at a distance. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just decided I needed to take the plunge. Mm -hmm. So I signed up to volunteer for a VBS this summer. <laughs> what? Well, hey, listen, you, no, no, no acting, no singing, nothing like that. No, no. I've got the time. I, I've got plenty of vacation time accrued, and, well, because I never use it. So I figured, well, maybe they could have someone there to help with the, uh, I don't know, the paperwork or something. Yeah. Well, geez, is it that bad? Well, no, I'm just sad. What, I what? turned them down. What? <laughs> well, when I said yes initially, my husband was disappointed. He wanted to do something different this summer. He mm. keeps talking about a road trip. I have oh, no idea oh, why. That sounds cool. <laughs> Look, I, I hate saying no. I'm no good at it. Mm. But after the conversation with him and the one that we all had, the writing was on the wall. I love serving the Lord, but maybe I just, I need some time to just, I don't know, be with him and, and find out where he's leading me. So I got out my planner and I started taking a look at, you know, where I could get some time back and oh, it was so hard. But I prayed about it and a couple of things kept coming up. Like, mm -hmm. like middle school mm -hmm. ministry, you know, it, it, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of weekends every mm -hmm. Thursday. Yeah. So I sat my kids down <laughs> and I asked them if just for a season, sure. if they wouldn't mind, if I took a step back 
Okay. And I was prepared for the worst, for, for tears and yeah. disappointment. Yes. <sighs> and they told me it was an answer to prayer. <laughs> <laughs> And I felt like, I felt like they didn't need me. Oh. And then I felt like God didn't oh, need me. No. And then when I said no to chairing VBS, mm -hmm. they said that was fine. They had someone else in mind. <laughs> <clears throat> sorry, sorry. Sound like another God thing. <laughs> well, I guess, Laurel. I know that I, I should see it that way, but if I'm being honest, I... I feel very insecure when I'm not busy. <laughs> oh, I hear you there. Now, for me, it's work, not church, but I know that feeling. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Hey, look, guys. Jeff's calling. Oh. Hey, hey Jeff? Hey, Stephen. Uh, look, man, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not there. I I'm going to need some help. I'm flat out stalled. Ah! I hear you, man, Jeff. You gotta hang in there. But with prayer and the right study guide, I know we can get through this. Okay. Uh, well, um, but I, I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere. It, it must feel that way, but we... No, really. I, actually, I'm really in the middle of nowhere. I haven't seen a, a, another car in like 10 minutes. Ah, oh, that's so hard. But we're all here for you. Whatever you need. Okay, great. Um, and then one of you's gonna bail me out. Well, well, well yeah, but you're coming over, right? I can't. I, I said I, I'm, I'm stalled. I'm literally stalled. We're, we're praying for you, man. So that was Jeff. Yeah. Duh. I don't think he's going to make it tonight. Aww. He says he's still stalled. Oh, oh that's too bad. Hey, um, wait. Is he, like, stalled or? What? Oh, never mind. Well, we've been having some fun with this idea of being stalled on our journeys. But the truth is, it is no fun to be stuck. To feel like you're just going through the motions. To wonder what happened to the joy and passion you once had for the things of God. It is every bit as frustrating and disorienting as sitting in a stalled car in the middle of nowhere with no help in sight. Now, we've learned that it can happen for all kinds of reasons. Burnout, laziness on our part, distraction, disappointment with life or with God. But sometimes it happens for a no apparent reason at all. God just suddenly seems distant, absent, irrelevant. Things that used to bring us joy, going to church, studying the scriptures, serving in a ministry, suddenly feel tedious and pointless. We begin to wonder if maybe there isn't something better, more exciting we can do with our time and energy, like take a nap maybe, or binge watch Netflix for a few hours. The mystics used to refer to seasons like this as seasons of desolation of soul. Listen to how one of the Masters describes it. Sometimes you will find yourself deprived and destitute of all feelings of devotion, and your soul will seem like a barren, sterile desert where there is no path or road leading to God. Now talk about being stalled. This poor traveler can't even find the road anymore. If you've ever been in a season like this, or if you're in a season like this right now, you know how unsettling and even frightening it can be. You begin to wonder if you'll ever find your joy and passion for faith again. 
But we've also learned that these stalled moments can become pivotal moments. That the Lord can meet us in these seasons and actually use them to direct us in new ways towards new experiences with Him. We've learned that even though there are no quick fixes or simple solutions, that there are things we can do to get going and growing again. We heard from Becky and Lindsay in our drama here. We sense that both of them are about to break through to better places spiritually. But it's going to require a step of faith for each of them. A step into unfamiliar territory. And chances are the same thing is true for many of us today. So let's catch up with the, the, the disciples one more time at another one of their stalled moments in the Gospels. In fact, we're going to catch up with them on one of the darkest and loneliest nights in their experience as disciples. And yet it turned out to be a moment in which they rediscovered Jesus. And a night in which one of them did something that no human being had ever done before. The story is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. We'll be looking at verses 20 through through 33. And we'll just kind of walk our way through the story and make some observations about life and faith. So let's pick it up, Matthew 14, beginning at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made, his, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. But later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Now this happens at the end of a remarkable day, a day in which Jesus fed 5,000 plus people with just some loaves and, and fish. It was such a remarkable day that at the end of that day, the people were ready to make Jesus king right then and there. But in the midst of all this excitement, Jesus hustles his disciples into the boat, shoves them offshore, and tells them he'll meet them on the other side. Now, I can't imagine that's what the disciples had in mind for that particular moment. It had already been a long day. The sun was setting. I'm sure all they wanted to do was to build a campfire and sit around it and relive the glory of the day with Jesus. Instead, now... They were going to have to row their way across the lake in the dark, and Jesus wasn't even going to be with them. Now, the Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long and 8 miles across. So it is no small thing to row your way across that lake, even under the best of conditions. But on this night, it was especially difficult because, we're told, the wind was against them. Now, notice, it's not like there's a storm at sea. Okay, they're not holding on for dear life. It's just the infernal wind blowing into their faces, making every stroke of the oars a chore and making progress just about impossible. Now, remember, some of these guys are seasoned fishermen. They know a thing or two about, about being out on the water and, and rowing a boat. But on this night, after hours and hours, straining at the oars, they're getting nowhere. They're tired, they're discouraged, and by the way, where's Jesus? And why did he send them out there to face this wind without him? Have you ever tried to row a boat or ride a bike or run or even walk into the wind? It's exhausting. It doesn't just wear you down, it, 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 it wears you out emotionally, physically, psychologically. It takes all the fun out of whatever it is you're doing and makes it feel like you're never going to get where you're going. It makes you wonder if, if it's even worth trying to get there in the first place. A couple of Saturdays ago, in the middle of the afternoon, just to relax a little bit, I turned on the TV and caught a little bit of the Masters Golf Tournament. Now, by the time I watched, the, the golfers were already on the back nine coming in towards home, and, and the commentators were talking about what a difficult day it had been, how brutal the conditions were. Now, I'm thinking to myself, it's golf, <laughs> all right? The sun is shining, they're wearing T-shirts, the azaleas are blooming, the birds are tweeting. I mean, how hard can it be? 
It turns out it was the wind. The wind had been howling across Augusta National for three days in a row distracting the players, blowing their drives all over the place, stirring up debris and sand into everyone's faces, and just plain wearing them out. No one was playing well. Well, if it's hard to golf against the wind, how much harder to live against the wind? Just to do everyday life. It's not, it's not always the storms of life that make life difficult. It's just that infernal wind blowing in our faces, the stress and strain of everyday life, making everything more difficult. Maybe you or someone you love has a chronic illness. Pain is a constant companion. Trips back and forth to the doctor, to the hospital, medication, treatment, consume time and energy almost every day. You begin to wonder if you're ever going to feel better again. And by the way, where's Jesus? Why hasn't he answered your prayers for healing or at least for relief? Or maybe you're dealing with financial hardship. And, and every, every, every trip to the grocery store, every bill that comes in the mail is fraught with anxiety and tension. You, you're working as hard as you can, but you can't seem to get ahead. You're trying to honor God. You're putting your money in the plate every week, but you can't keep up. You, you can't even make ends meet. And by the way, where's Jesus? Why isn't he providing for you the way he promised he would? Or maybe you're dealing with some relational pain. There's tension in your home or maybe in your extended family. Everyday interactions are suddenly tense and awkward. You, you always feel like you're on the defensive. You can't concentrate at work. You can't remember the last time you laughed out loud. And by the way, where's Jesus? You can't even go to church for hope and encouragement because you get to church and all you see are friends and family sitting together, smiling, enjoying each other, reminding you of the pain in your heart and the fact that you're far away from people that you love and maybe even from God. So it's not always the storms that test our faith and stall our journey. Sometimes it's just that infernal wind blowing in our faces, making everyday life difficult. But as we make our way through this story, as we take a closer look at what hap what's happening, we'll discover there are three things we can know and three things we can do when the wind is against us. The first thing we can know is that Jesus is watching. Jesus is watching. Look again at verse 23. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Now, in Mark's account of the story, he adds an interesting detail. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. The hills around the Sea of Galilee are so high that from many vantage points, you can literally see across the entire lake. And on a moonlit night, you could even make out a small boat stuck in the middle out there. And so we can imagine Jesus up there in the hills praying but every once in a while, he looks up from his prayer to see how the disciples are doing. And he sees them out there struggling, straining at the oars. But I don't think he was looking up and saying, stinks to be them. <laughs> I think he was praying for them. I think he was pulling for them. Heavenly Father, give them strength. Help them to persevere. Meet them in this moment. So while the disciples are out there rowing their, their arms off, wondering why Jesus has left them alone, all the while he's up there watching. Not just watching, but monitoring their progress and pulling for them. The curious thing is that he sees them out there he can see that they're struggling, that they're stuck in the middle of the lake, and he leaves them there. In fact, he's going to let them struggle 
almost all night long. When our kids were little, we used to take them to the beach a lot. It was a cheap, easy way to let them have some fun and get some exercise for a few hours. They were happy playing in the sand or splashing around in the waves. As they got older, they learned how to dive into the waves and ride them back into shore. Well, one day we were there, and the, the waves were especially big and strong that day. And Karen and I were sitting in our sand chairs at the water's edge, kind of keeping an eye on the kids. And the three older ones were out in the waves, diving in and riding them back and laughing their heads off. Our youngest was about five or six at the time, and he was still learning how to navigate the waves. One particular huge wave came in and just completely knocked him over, and he disappeared under the foaming water. Instinctively, I got up to go rescue him, and Karen grabbed me by the arm and said, wait, give him a minute. And sure enough, after a few long seconds, he bobbed up from out of the water with a look of panic on his face. And the first thing he did was to look towards us. And the moment he saw us watching him, he knew he was going to be okay. He laughed at himself, he wiped the water off his face, and dove back in for yet another try. My five-year-old didn't need me to rescue him that day. He just needed me to watch him to keep an eye on him, to monitor his progress, and to be at the ready to help him if he should need me to. Because if he was ever going to learn how to manage the waves on his own, he was going to have to struggle a little bit. He was going to have to get knocked down a few times in order to gain the skill and the strength, not just to survive the waves, but to ride them. Twenty years later, he lives in Florida and surfs with sharks. In the same way, the disciples needed to struggle that night. If they were ever going to grow up, if they were ever going to manage wind and waves, literally and metaphorically, they needed this struggle. They needed to strengthen their arms and their faith. Now, I don't think Jesus sent the wind to teach them a thing or two. This just happened to be a windy night. But Jesus let the wind blow for a while. He could have gone to rescue them, but he, he chose to leave them alone for a while. But all the while, he was watching. And Jesus is watching you too. He knows where you are. He knows what's going on. He knows what you need. He's watching as you manage that health crisis, as you make your trips back and forth to the doctor as you learn to trust God even in pain, even when the outcome is uncertain. He's watching you when you sit down with your bills and your budget, trying to find a way, learning how to make ends meet and be generous at the same time. He's watching as you learn to navigate those challenging relationships in your life, extending grace to people even when they're being difficult, even when you're feeling hurt. Jesus is watching. He knows. He's praying for you. He's pulling for you. He knows what you need. And, 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 and when the time is right for your growth and for, and for his good purposes, he will come to you as we're going to find out. But in the meantime, all you can do is wait. So if the first thing we need to know is that Jesus is watching, the first thing we need to do is wait for him. Just wait and be patient and persevere. As eager as we are for things to be easier, as, easy, as eager as we are for the wind to die down, as eager as we are to be going and growing again, sometimes we need the struggle, and we just need to keep on rowing, keep on trusting, knowing that Jesus is watching. Well, let's pick up the story, verse 26. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Remember now, it was sunset when Jesus shoves them offshore, and now it's almost dawn. So Jesus has left them out there for a long time. And you know how slowly time passes when you're awake in the middle of the night. 
And so after these many hours passed with little or no sign of progress and their muscles exhausted and feeling more and more discouraged, more and more troubled by Jesus' absence. But they're about to discover that Jesus is never really absent. He may be silent sometimes, but he's never absent. And when the time is right for our growth, for his purposes, he will come to us. And so the second thing we need to know when we're stalled is that Jesus is coming. He is coming. Now, at first, the disciples don't realize that it's Jesus. And so we get a little glimpse into their frame of mind at this point. It helps to know that in the ancient world, in the Jewish worldview, open water, the seas, were, were, were the abode of chaos. That's where darkness and danger was lurking. Think Noah and the flood. Think Jonah and the great fish. Think the opening lines of Genesis. The earth was formless and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Open water is where bad things happened. So after hours of battling the wind and the waves, when they see a shadowy figure coming towards them in the dark, walking on the water, their first thought isn't, hey, look, guys, it's Jesus. <laughs> it never occurs to them that Jesus might be out there on that windy night. And I think a similar thing happens to us when we're feeling worn down by the circumstances of life, when we're facing a headwind. We get so overwhelmed by the circumstances, so worn down, we're so focused on all the problems that it never occurs to us that Jesus might actually be present in those difficult moments, that he might, in fact, be speaking to us. We go to church out of force of habit, but we really don't expect anything to happen there. We pick up our Bibles, maybe, but we're so distracted or so cynical, he really doesn't, we can't hear him saying anything to us. Friends and... Uh, Brothers and sisters in Christ speak into our lives words of wisdom and counsel, but we dismiss it, we discount it. They don't really know what's going on. It never occurs to us that Jesus might actually be present and might be speaking to us in those moments. So if the second thing we need to know is that Jesus is coming, the second thing we need to do is look for him. Look for him. Because he may be coming in some unusual ways. He may be speaking in ways we've never heard him speak before. Years ago, when I went through a particularly dark time in my spiritual journey, I found that my devotional times were dry as dust, and my study of the Scriptures had become a chore to me. And I, I wondered why God wasn't speaking to me anymore. And it wasn't for a period of weeks and even months when I began to realize He was speaking to me, but just not in the usual ways. There was one line in a novel I was reading that spoke about the transformative power of silence. And it helped me understand what was happening in my life right then. I was off at a weekend conference just as, as a guest and as a tender. And the speaker up front began calling off a random assortment of names in the course of his message. And one of those names was Brian as if the Lord was letting me know he knew I was there. A stand of trees outside my window, slowly coming to life again after a long winter, reminding me that my faith would again come to life once more. He was speaking, but in ways I wasn't accustomed to. Think about the small group we've just been watching here. It's an odd assortment of folks, quirky characters, each of them with their secret struggles, sometimes wondering why they're even together. And yet to their surprise, they find that God is speaking to them through one another of all things. So when we find ourselves stalled, when it feels as though God is distant, know that Jesus is coming. Look for him. Listen for him even in some unusual places and some unlikely voices. The third thing we need to know when we're stalled is that Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. Let's go to verse 28 and the really exciting part of the story. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. 
Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Remember now, it's dark. The wind is howling. The water is a choppy, foamy maelstrom. And a ghost-like figure is lurking off the starboard bow. Here's Peter, steadying himself on the gunwale, peering into the dark, and he shouts into the wind, If it's you, Lord, tell me to come to you. Now, you've got to love Peter in this moment. I mean, who says that? I mean, say what you will about Peter's big mouth and his impulsive nature. On um, this night, Peter is everything a disciple is supposed to be. If his master is out there in the dark, in the gale, on the water, then that's where he wants to be. And if it means stepping out of that boat, doing something terrifying that he's never done before, well, then that's what he's about to do. If it's you, Lord, tell me to come to you. I've got to believe. Jesus smiled when Peter said that. And when he held out his hand and said, come. The scripture tells us what happens next, and it's so matter of fact, it's almost comical. Then Peter got down out of the boat, as if that's what everybody does in the middle of the lake. Walked on the water, as if it happens all the time, and came toward Jesus. He did it. He walked on water. He did something no human being had ever done before, something he never imagined doing. He did it. Now, it didn't last long, did it? It didn't take long for the wind and the waves to get to him. But notice, notice, when he begins to sink, he doesn't reach back for the boat. He reaches forward towards Jesus. Lord, save me, he says. And Jesus does. Lifts him up, sets him down on the water. Now, what a moment that must have been. The two of them standing there next to each other on the Sea of Galilee. I got to believe Peter wiped the water from his face and laughed out loud at the moment. Two people together like no human beings had ever been together before. What a moment. John Ortberg has written a wonderful book based on this story. And the title says it all. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. <laughs> he reminds us that the boat was the safe place to be in that moment. The boat was familiar. The boat was comfortable. Peter and his friends had spent many, many nights out on that boat before, but he had never walked on water. But Jesus was out there, and if he was calling, then that's where Peter was going. And if it meant stepping out of the boat, that's what Peter was going to do. So how badly do you want to be with Jesus? How badly do you want to be unstalled? Badly enough to do something you've never done before? Badly enough to step out of your boat whatever it is, your comfort zone, your familiar territory, your predictable ways of dealing with life and relationships. I mean, how bad do you want it to get unstuck, to get going and growing again? Jesus is calling, and the only way is to get out of that boat and take a faith-sized risk. The characters we met in our drama, Lindsay here, her, her boat was her calendar. As long as her calendar was full, she felt safe. She felt most comfortable when, when she was busy, when she was doing, when she was serving, when she was underlining. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But at this particular time, Jesus wasn't in those places. Jesus was in the silence. Jesus was in the stillness. And he was asking her to come to him there to meet him in ways she had never met him before, but she was going to have to get out of her boat. Lindsay's boat was keeping people and God at arm's length. She felt safe at work. She felt comfortable at home watching TV. 
There's nothing wrong with working hard and relaxing at home. But Jesus was calling her out of those familiar places and into the maelstrom of ministry, into the risk of relationship. Inviting her to, to, to follow her. He, he was waiting for her out there. And he's waiting for you out there. He's waiting for you in the dark. He's waiting for you on the waves. He's waiting for you where it's windy, in an unfamiliar place. And he's beckoning you to come and walk towards him. To meet him like you've never met him before. Are you, are you willing to go there? You're going to have to get out of your boat. Now, I don't know what your boat happens to be. Or what step you have to take. Maybe... Maybe, maybe what you need to do is, is come to celebrate recovery. To finally face that hurt or habit or hang-up that you've been living with for so long, it's actually comfortable and familiar. Maybe, maybe you need to walk away from a familiar relationship that's actually keeping you from getting closer to God. Maybe you need to join a life community or, or check out one of our student ministries, middle school or high school. It's one of the scariest things in the world to walk into a living room or walk into a room where you don't know anybody. But that may be the step the Lord's asking you to take. And if you want more out of your life and more out of your faith, and that's the step you need to take. Maybe he's asking you to take a step of stewardship to grow your giving to 5% or 10% or more and discover what it's like to trust him and experience his provision. Maybe he's asking you to take a step of service at the church, in your community. Maybe to sign up for Spring Serve. There are some of us here today I know who heard that Spring Serve announcement and it never crossed your mind to actually sign up for it. You never have and you never will. Well, maybe, maybe the Lord's waiting for you Saturday morning, May 7th. And he wants to meet you in a way he's never met you before. Maybe it's going on one of our cross-cultural learning experiences, formerly known as mission trips. I was out about town earlier this week in one of the stores nearby, and a, a, a Grace Chapel person came running to me across the store and announced loud enough for everybody to hear, I'm going on my first missions trip. <laughs> she told me she'd been praying for these people in this place for years, and now she was going to get to go. Now, that's a faith-sized risk. That's stepping out of the boat. How badly do you want to get unstuck? Badly enough to take a week of your summer and go to an unfamiliar place and experience the power and presence of God like never before? Well, the story ends with the two of them making their way back to the boat. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So they all got to worship him, but only Peter got to walk with him. I've heard preachers beat up on Peter for letting the wind and the waves get to him. He took his eyes off Jesus. <laughs> right? You've heard it. And they say it as if they would have done better. As if Peter is the loser. The only losers in that boat were the guys who never got out of it. Never took a step. What do we do when a toddler takes her very first steps, pushes off the couch and lurches toward the coffee table, makes one, two, three steps, falls flat on her face? Do we scold her? No, we stand up and cheer. Way to go! Because we know it's the first of many, many steps. We know a whole new chapter of life is opening up for her. Adventures she never imagined. Michael Card says of this story, Sometimes sinking is more important than walking, more life-changing, more transformational. There's nothing wrong with stumbling once in a while. Nothing wrong with doubting once in a while. What's wrong, what's tragic, is never taking a step. Sixteen years ago, Karen and I got out of our boat. A successful life, a comfortable home, familiar community. Life was great, but a little too predictable. And suddenly Jesus was calling to a new place, a new challenge, bigger and harder than anything we'd ever done before. And, and we were scared to death, scared of failure, scared of making a mistake. 
But if Jesus was calling us to Grace Chapel, then that's where we wanted to be. And I can assure you, there were many times those first few years when I felt like I was going under. Lord, help me, I cried. And he did. And I wouldn't trade those moments for anything. And here we are a decade and a half later, growing and serving in ways we never could have imagined. So when you find yourself stalled on the journey of faith, when it feels like the wind is against you and you're not making any progress, remember that Jesus is watching. Wait for him. Jesus is coming. Look for him. It's got to be Jesus calling, right? I mean, pick up the phone already. It took me 33 minutes to get to that line and the phone rings. If you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. Let's pray.